Reading Doom Messiah. Dune Messiah is the most misunderstood of the Frank Herbert novels. Dune Messiah Prologue by Brian Herbert. Welcome to Reading Dune, a podcast where we read Dune by Frank Herbert and talk about it. But we're not going to be reading just Dune today. We're going to be reading Dune Messiah. Ooh, ooh. So if you're a Fremen or a first time reader, indeed, this podcast is for you. My name is Caleb Pauls. And I'm Evan Diaz. And together, we are going to read some Dune. Yeah, we are. We're back, baby. We made Let's it. go. Let's go. Oh, I, I didn't think, I don't know if we would ever get to this point when I, when we started the podcast uh, two years yeah. ago. Um, Two years ago? Yeah, we started in March 2020. Like we, COVID had just happened. We were all stuck in our homes. Wow. And we decided to make a podcast in our free time. <laughs> Dang. Uh, Look how far we've come. Look at all our friends in the chat. I mean, yeah, currently we have 13 people live with us on YouTube. And we just want to say thank you to to everybody. Thank you so much. To be honest, let's be real. We would not be here doing Dune Messiah if so many of you had not reached out and said, when are you reading Dune Messiah? <laughs> Ev- so many of you. <laughs> every email, every tweet, every YouTube comment. There were so many people saying, please do Dune Messiah. And you know what? We're here. Because, We're here. Of, because of people like you, we are here. That's 60,000 60, listeners just on Spotify alone. Ooh, we have uh, 1,750 YouTube subscribers and 2,700 people on Twitter. You guys are the reason this is happening because, I mean, yeah, we have an audience now who wants who wants to know what happens in Dune. They liked the first part, I guess. Yeah, well, the first part was all right. <laughs> I think we did a lot better. We've gotten a lot better at this since we first started. Those first episodes were rough, so thank you. For everyone who stuck it through with us. Yeah, we love you. Uh, Stomp's Already? job crew on YouTube says, when are you starting Children of Dune? So oh, uh, maybe we'll after keep this that one. one a mystery too. Yeah, <laughs> definitely after Messiah. <laughs> definitely. I just want to say, yeah, thank you also for just waiting. We said we were going to do this at the beginning of the year and we just, we know Dune fans can wait and we're, good at waiting <laughs> but we didn't want to be that too rude soon. to you too soon, too soon. Right? i moved back across the country settled into a new job finally got into our own place with my wife so like we are moving baby steps forward and this is to be honest i think the, our first real time evan that we had the time to say let's actually sit down into this podcast yeah it's been a lot of stuff going on starting businesses doing all kinds of stuff but we're here we made it. Also, you know, raising children. That's happening in the background as well. It's always happening in the background. <laughs> yes. Constantly. Forever a part of your your life. Yeah. Okay. So, Evan. Yeah. You just finished reading the introduction and this uh, Q&A. Yes. What were your initial thoughts when what happened? Okay, okay. The introduction was like just so ominous. Bum 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 bum. You know, bum. it was like, oh, okay. You know, like coming at it with, I mean, you've dropped hints. And, you know, people on, on the Discord and just in our conversations have dropped hints about 
stuff that's going to happen. But I really honestly don't know what's going to happen. And then this introduction comes along and it was just so tense and like politically charged. But, uh, you know, like to which direction? Nobody knows. It's just general political heaviness to it. And I was like, oh, gosh, what's going to happen in this book? Um, so that was that was my those are my thoughts on the intro. Um, and then the the Q&A with Bronzo, right? Bronzo mm-hmm. from X. Yep. Nailed it. Great. We got a now that the movie came out we, and we realized that all of our pronunciation was just so wrong about everything. We are I'm not like, the, we are not your source for the correct pronunciation. Right. I'm like so hesitant to say anything. Um it kind of felt like a previously on dune you know yeah uh, and it was it was it was really cool like getting a, a little bit of a um reminder of what happened but also interwoven in there is a whole bunch of other stuff right. about what's happening now so it's mm-hmm. like ooh, and like towards the end he really like turns it on and and shows us some new stuff i thought it was cool okay cool so let's uh let's let's jump right in here to um basically the backstory of okay so dune messiah was obviously released after dune dune ends in this giant triumphant climax where paul like makes a fool of the emperor of the harkonnens and the fremen are finally on top on the planet and bagpipes are ringing in the background. Come just on, the whole epic. thing. <laughs> and and we we get this point where the our hero is victorious. And usually, on your first time reading it, you feel that Paul won. And and Frank did such a good job of writing it that I think so many people, or didn't do a good job of writing it, that so many people missed the actual point he was trying to say. Yeah, they got so caught up in the hero's journey that they missed the underlying thing. What Frank was trying to do, how we all fall for these charismatic leaders right. who ultimately don't have our best interests in mind. Yeah. So when this book came out in 1969, it was heralded as the uh, Dune Messiah was called the disappointment of the year by the magazine National Lampoon. This book was hated because of what it does to Paul. This second novel in the Dune series requires a deconstruction of the carefully crafted hero myth that is Paul Muhadib to reveal that that dark side of the Messiah phenomenon. Oh, no. So many readers, when they read this book, are not ready to see Paul fall like this. And, you know... And Frank explained this right from the beginning, right? Is he kills off the fierce and loyal Duncan Idaho right. or the idealistic Liet Kynes. All of these people die for Paul. And we don't know if this is good or bad. So it's very easy to miss the first time you go through it. So and over and over, though, Frank tries to spell it out in Dune, right? Especially with lines like, this is classic, No more terrible disaster can befall your people than for them to fall into the hands of a hero. Right? That's Liet Kine's death at the very end. Like, Frank is spelling this out, and yet every time we fall into it. Well, it's just, it's what we're used to, you know? I mean, I get it, Frank. Like, you're a, you're a genius person, like, a genius author. Great for you. But it's the hero's journey. Can you blame us for wanting that to be, you know, like wanting the story to meet our expectations the way that they've always been met? You know, like he just he did something groundbreaking and then he was confused why people like didn't understand it. (laughs) Shut up, Frank. You're too smart (laughs) for your own good. Well, okay, so Frank knows this firsthand because he was a speechwriter for Republican senators. Yeah. You know, because Dune, he wrote when he was 
65. Like he was still like, that was his first major success. He's doing all these odd jobs. And one of those was being a speechwriter. Mm -hmm. And so he saw firsthand how power megalomania and magnetic politicians, like their mistakes were amplified so much more and why it's so dangerous. So whether we like it or not, the story of Dune is not a hero's journey. It's more like a Greek tragedy. Oh, Paul, no. Like, Paul. So the hero is, in a Greek tragedy, the hero is a part god, part human, becomes prideful, overconfident, lets their narcissism grow, and the great fall overtakes them. So Dune is just that. And Dune, this gets expanded on in Dune Messiah. So we as the readers, we need to watch for what happens for those who try to please Muhadib and get close to him. In doing so, they want to secure more power for themselves and how we misuse that power under the guise of worship. Because we have to remember, Paul is now worshipped as a god. Yeah. And I don't think he wants to be worshipped as a god. Right, But. Probably not. That's what's going to happen. And there are going to be people that are going to want to get close to him and what's <clears throat> going to happen to them. Yeah. I, uh, I, I don't think he wants to be worshipped as a god, but like, he's probably not mad about it. I, not I, all the time, at least. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, come on. And he's got the prescience, so everyone just worships him <laughs> because he can see the future. Right. So Dune Messiah is Empire Strikes Back of Dune. Everything Ooh. is turned on its head, and the world of Dune is about to get expanded. We see this even with Bronzo of Ix. We have a new planet just popping up. Boop. But it's important to know that Frank had already written parts of Messiah and Children of Dune before he ever published it. So the story was already set. Okay. So we just need to watch for this. So that's the story of Dune Messiah. What we thought was heroic and fun probably wasn't. A jihad just got spread across everywhere. Are the Fremen being bastardized in a weird way because he came into it and manipulated them? There's a bunch of weird things that happened in Dune that we kind of just brush over. And so we're going right. to talk about him now. Man, I just want Paul to be happy, but that's not what I'm going to get. <laughs> we all want Paul to be I happy. Just, I just want Paul to like retire. <laughs> Live on a oh. beach or something. That's yeah. not what, what, what's coming. <laughs> Just lots of sand. That's all that's coming. Yeah. <laughs> it's a beach, but no ocean. <laughs> oh, Lord. So before chapter one happens, before we get into the book, we get this transcript of an interrogation that's happening in a Fremen death cell. Right. So also important to note, this is also not the original prologue to the book. What? Uh, yeah, the first prologue just had a recap of what happened. Um, and wait, 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 the 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 intro or the the the, the interview, the part? interview part, the interview part oh, is okay. new. So it literally uh, was previously on Dune. Yes, yes. Interesting. So the prologue we have now with Bronzo came up from a request from a UK publisher to have the recap done more elegantly. Hmm. And I think Frank delivered on that promise. It's nice the editor the editor came back. Uh, can you do this more in a literary fashion? Like, give us something a little deeper here. Gotcha. And I think when we read this, we're supposed to be reading this as um, an archaeological observer who, after thousands of years, has stumbled upon these transcripts and are reading them for the first time. So it is this, we're supposed to look at it from an outsider observer thing. And, and I mean, we have that with the quotes at the beginning. Right. Uh, right. So it's that same kind of thing here. Um, it's important to note this interview. I believe it's up for debate here, but I think this happens after the events of Dune Messiah. Oh, okay. E everything already taken place. And we're looking back on the reign of Emperor Paul Muhadib and the impact it had on all mankind for all of history. Oh, gosh. Okay. <laughs> Just to make sure it's not too heavy here. 
Because Muad'Dib's imperial reign generated more historians than any other era in human history. Everyone was talking about this moment. Wow. Something is happening right now we need to talk about. So, and in Dune, we get a lot of that conversation just happening on one side. We get the Fremen perspective, right? Right. Paul, Paul is their prophesied Messiah who came, liberated them from the hostilities of the Harkonnens, the Empire, and the planet Dune itself, right? That Dune was hard to live on. Then he showed up and made it easier. Like, he is yeah. the liberator of their people. And because of that, and he's also a god, it, like, can see the future, legions of Fremen warriors spread across the universe as a plague telling everyone the good news of Emperor Muhadib. How did yeah. they do this? They usually did it at the point of a Chris knife. Oh, gosh. So, yeah, right. The face of the Imperium is now changed forever, and everyone is talking about it. So, Bronzo is a historian from the planet Ix. Right? Ix is a planet we've never heard of, We will, but later on we will know... This is not a spoiler, but Ix is a technological planet. So we know that computers made in the likeness of the human mind are still forbidden, right? We can't make AI yet, but the Ixians really flirt with that line. They'll go <laughs> right up to the edge. They are the Apple computer of Dune. They just <laughs> want, they're trying to make it integrate, but not quite there yet. Wow. Wow. That was bold. I like it. <laughs> we and, are reading Dune is available on Apple Podcasts, so <laughs> please don't take us down. The Bronzo of Ix is the 1984 Apple commercial where he's just taking it and he's just throwing the hammer up into the okay. screen. Okay, that's nice. That's like <laughs> we're, we're, we're working, them working them in there. <laughs> All right. So evidently, Bronzo holds some views that are counter the t then the mainline gospel of the empire right and he was taken because he was spreading quote unquote misinformation about the holy emperor right well they said heresy right right yeah this so. is more than just information this is like not telling the truth on a very very spiritual level on what they think truth is right we're not not telling their truth Yes. I have so, a I have a troubled history with the word heresy. So I'm like... <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're catching on though. Okay. So yeah. this landed him in a Quizarot death cell. A what? A Quizarot death cell. Quizarot? I mean, I'm here for it. Okay. That's a fun word. This is not the first time we've seen this word either. Evan just looks at me shocked. <laughs> So, we actually here get this in chapter 30, The Death of Liet Kynes. Okay. In, in the paragraph before, in the excerpt, it talks about, I'll just read it here. This Fremen religious adaptation, then, is the source of what we recognize as the pillars of the universe, whose quizat to fuid are among us in all signs and proof and prophecy. The quizat to fahid are these missionaries, priests, who are going and telling people the pillars of the universe to which Muhadib holds up. Oh. So he's in a in a rel a religious uh warrior FBI CIA death cell. <laughs> Secret police of the religious order. Right. They're like crusaders. And it's a death cell He's not leaving. This is his last interview yeah. ever. And which he does a great job of using his time wisely. Right. <laughs> Question. Am I going to yeah. need both books now to like go back and forth? Am I going to like? That's a good question. Um, No, you have the internet and you have me. It's probably a pretty good resource because I'm probably going to do Fair. a little research. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> but uh yeah there is a lot that crosses over especially in those excerpts because the excerpts are taken after what history is writing about this time right 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 right. oh all right here we go are you ready to start this interview yes yeah we haven't even started it yet 20 minutes in guys here we go <laughs> 
So this priest starts it's now it, in the book, it's Q and a format. I'm not going to do it um, here. I'm going to kind of liven it up a little bit, but imagine it's this dark cell, probably underground. And the priest is now doing this interrogation. And he says, what led you to take your particular po- approach to a history of Muhadib? Ooh, ooh, ooh. yes, ooh. Evan. You know who I thought would do a really good job at acting this out? Oh, yeah, yeah. Tell, do tell. Andy Serkis. Mm. As which character? As Bronzo. Oh. Oh. Yeah, I like, like that. Like, you know in Black Panther when... Uh, uh, What's his name? Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo Baggins is uh, interrogating him, and he's like, <laughs> "Sing, what is love? Baby, don't hurt me." That whole that whole part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I was thinking, but like, obviously not with a South African accent. Maybe with a South African accent. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know what that accent from X is supposed to sound like. I'm not going to do that accent when I read it. I just want you to know. <laughs> Probably everyone is thanking me for that too at this point because yeah. We have lots of comments how bad my voice acting is. <laughs> and you will only get more of that in this podcast, this 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 book. All right, here we go. So Bronzo basically says, why should I answer your questions? The priest says, because I will preserve your words. That's nice. Well, yeah, it's the ultimate bait to a historian. So Bronzo says, sure. He'll cooperate only because he knows this record will probably literally be stored forever. Like this is right. these records are going into the Vatican of the Imperium. Right. And his hope is that one day, thousands of years from now, someone will find these words. And because of that, they'll have a more well-rounded view of history. So Bronzo starts teaching. Start starting with saying how there's no way that he'll ever convince the priest who's sitting standing in front of him that this that their fremen worldview is completely misplaced because they've staked too much of their truth on it being true bronzo right. says how history is obsessed with dune not arrakis but dune it's this mythos the home world of the fremen the still suits and of course the giant ass sandworms <laughs> Right? It, how can it not be going down in history of this epic of Paul who r- rose to this thing and rode the giant sandworm? Like right. it's it's got the gravitas to it. And we all know Arrakis is a one crop planet. What crop is that, Evan? The spice. The spice. What's the uh, what's the spice? Why is the spice important? It's uh, okay. Okay. I think I can actually answer this question now. Yeah, you can. It allows. Uh, it's like this crazy uh, future drug that allows the uh, space travel, like crazy, crazy space travel to happen because without it, they wouldn't be able to like do the calculations to be able to like navigate space at that speed. But also it's like really addictive and like the most important thing in the universe, basically. Uh, it makes everything in the this like society in Dune in the Dune universe keep spinning. Right. Who who give me two big groups who like are and who need the spice? Um, the, um, the guild, the, uh, what's the word, the other word, there's another word. The, this is the guild navigators? Yeah, no, it's like the something guild. No, you're talking thinking about Chom? Sure, maybe, I don't know. No, it's not Chom. Whatever, the guild, um, and uh, I don't, I don't, I don't know who the other one is that you're looking for. Oh, it's been a while since we read these. It has been a while. <laughs> it's showing. Uh, I'll give you a hint. Um, all female. Oh, the Bene Gesserit. There sure. we go. Yeah, they can't. They can't do the Reverend Mothers without the spice. Oh yeah. 
and the Reverend Mothers allow them to go remember all of the memories of their past lives. So they need it. And so Arrakis is a one crop planet, right? Even Paul was like, if I get rid of the spice, I get rid of everything. And that was his like chokehold on the universe. Still is. So the priest scoffs at Bronzo, asking him to please explain the sacred spice. Bronzo says, sacred. As with all things sacred, it gives with one hand and takes with the other. It extends life and allows the adept to foresee the future. It also ties him to a cruel addiction, marks his eyes as yours are marked. Totally blue, without any white. Your eyes are organs of sight, become one thing without contrast. A single view. So I thought that was um that, that he said he said a lot like right you take the spice because sure it allows you well, it allows Paul to see the future but also it you can only see one thing you can only see your point of time you're not seeing other people's perspectives here of what you could be what harm you could happen outside of right. all of this so the priest is outraged of course such heresy brought you to the cell. Bronzer responds, I was brought to this cell by your priest. As with all your priests, you you learned early to call the truth heresy. Yikes. The priest tells Bronzo, you're here because you dared to say that Paul Atreides lost something essential to his humanity before he could become the Muhadib. So, Matt, Evan, my question to you is, do you think Paul Atreides lost something essential to to his humanity in order to become Muhadib. Yeah. I think he lost a lot of things essential to his humanity over a long period of time. I think the movie, sorry, if those who are listening in the far future, uh, Dune Part 1 came out in October. It's now March, so it's all kind of fresh in our brains mm -hmm. still. In the movie... They do a good job at that very end of the fight scene. If you have subtitles on, you can hear the voices in his head saying, like, the kids watch Haderach needs to rise. And to do so, he has to die in order to become another being. And I think right. what Bronzo is, is insinuating here is what died was his humanity. And he became something not human. Right. Bronzo also notes how the events of Dune really did change Paul forever. Paul was trying to fight the uh, jihad, right? And then the death of his father. He was like, oh, that hurts. Maybe I should let it happen. No, I shouldn't do it. The death of Duncan. Oh, that was bad. Um, I've been trying to save him and I can't. Right. And that, that's rough. And then once the death of his firstborn happened, that was that was the straw that broke the camel's back. Yeah. He was like, screw everybody. I'm going to show the universe what pain feels like. And, yeah. and he did. But I mean, also, just like even before the book starts, he was like raised to be like like with with the Bene Gesserit training and the Mentat training and all of that stuff that was from the very beginning of his life they were taking away regular life stuff from him like he was never going to be a normal kid a normal teenager you know he yeah he was groomed for this and there were plans already in place that he couldn't really control right it just yeah, he's. I think Paul's a good kid and got put in a bunch of crappy situations, and was told like deal with it. And this is this is what we're getting. But that being said, Bronzo does see true nobility in Paul as he fled into the desert with his pregnant mother. So as he leaves with Lady Jessica, Bronzo's like, I I see that right. You didn't stay. You like went on your own. You claimed the planet as yours. I see that. That was the planet was given to you. I could see that as being noble. But the priest was just furious at this point. The, and say, he just yells at him. The flaw in you historians is you'll never leave the well enough alone. You see true nobility in the holy Muhadib, but you must append a cynical footnote. 
it's no wonder that the Bene Gesserit also denounce you. So, clue, context clue, the Bene Gesserit also don't like the Ixians. Not big fans of the people on planet X. Yeah. So, but I don't know. Are the Bene Gesserit trustworthy in this scenario? In uh, any scenario? In any, right. <laughs> See, now we're starting to sound like Fremen. Like, don't trust anybody. Yeah. Well, he's old Fremen, not these new Imperial Fremen. <laughs> Bronzo also knows how the Bene Gesserit were directly responsible for Paul becoming the holy Muhadib. Bronzo was not quiet about that fact that the Bene Gesserit were, in fact, crossing bloodlines, trying to perfect humanity, and the Lady Jessica literally taught Paul all of the sisterhood secrets creating a super being right in doing it like they, the Bene well, Gesserit <laughs> yeah they're not they're not um they're not all bad they're not all good either they've done a bunch of bad things <laughs> plus the Bene Gesserit wanted to control their Kizrak Chatteract right he, they didn't want him to have free will at all. They right. set up an entire religion for centuries around this exact moment happening. There's a lot of subtle manipulation happening yeah. here. The priest says, if I had any doubts about your death sentence, you have dispelled him. So Bronzo has completely accepted his death at this point, saying, I can only die once. And he warns the priest, don't make a martyr out of me. <laughs> Like that, and my words will become even more powerful if we do that. Wait, 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 wait. Where's that line? Oh, yeah. The, what I thought was interesting was the they italicized me, and then mm. so it's like, beware lest you make a martyr out of me. Right. You know? Where the who's the other martyr? What's happening? Well, I think they're talking about Paul here. Right. Like, do you want a religion to come up and surprise, like, spring up because you murdered me? Right. And now you have to deal with a bunch of me's? Yeah. No. Right. So, but Bronzo holds the Fremen accountable for the rise of Paul. Right? Sure, the Bene Gesserit set up the path for Paul to walk down, but it's Fremen who are the ones who gave Paul his first major dose of spice. Right. In this Fremen ritual, in the spice orgy, therefore opening up Paul to the visions of the future, and in the, not only in the the spice orgy, but in the taking of the Reverend when he took the water of life just for himself and had to transform it, like that was also a Fremen ritual, and he became the Kwasar Tatarak for real then, and this same. Ritual also awakened the unborn Aaliyah, which we're gonna. Aaliyah is all over this book. We're gonna meet her a lot, and she oh, is great, crazy, awesome, <laughs> crazy, awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so Bronzo accuses the Fremen of severe cruelty for doing this. He says, "Have you considered what it meant for Alina to be born into this universe fully cognitive?" possessed by all her mother's memories and knowledge. No rape could be more terrifying. The priest, the priest just shakes this off by saying, without the holy moments of Muhadib, or without these holy moments, Muhadib would not have become the leader of all Fremen, and Aaliyah would not be Saint Aaliyah of the knife. Like, they needed to be, that's part of their identity, their deity, is this mm. ritual. Bronzo just scoffs. Without your blind Fremen cruelly, you would not be a priest. Ah, I know you, Fremen. You think Muhadib is yours because he made it with Chani and adopted your Fremen customs. But he was an Atreides first, trained by the Bene Gesserit. He promised to transform your desert planet into a water-rich paradise, all while he dazzled you with such visions and took your virginity. Thoughts? Do you think? What do you think? Do you think Bronze is accurate in saying that? Uh, <laughs> Evan's speechless. 
Those, those were big statements, you know, like he took your virginity. That's, that's just like in, inflammatory yeah. speech. He's just oh, like, yeah, being, you know, them, them's fighting words. Right. He is, he is, Paul is the Imperium and the Bene Gesserit wrapped up in his nice, pretty boy like jawline and given to the Fremen. And the Fremen can't help themselves when they see him. They just, right. yes, we need you. And in doing so, he used them. Right. He used them not for their best benefit. Sure, he gave them all their promises, but. Is that the way you want to get your prompt? Like, like Liet Kynes has had the thing set up. It would have worked in 300 generations. Right. They just took the shortcut. Right. And in doing so, I think personally, Caleb's thoughts, they lost a lot of what made them Fremen right. in doing so. They became the Imperium. They became the people they were trying to get out. You know what I mean? Like right. uh, Duke Leto talks about the Fra Luchas and like this class system. They just injected themselves into the class system, but at the top. Right. They just became a part of it. They just became the oppressors. Dang. Like as soon as you, yeah, you're not fixing the problem. You're actually only making it worse, but now you benefit. So it's not as bad. Okay. There's so much politics to get into that. <laughs> I, I, I got to stop. <laughs> the, the priest can't handle this. Right, he's just freaking out. Bronzo says that sure, the face of Dune has been changed ecologically, but it also taught the Imperium other lessons. It taught the universe that Fremen could kill Sardaukar, which is pretty big because the Empire was only held together. And oh, the Empire was only held together by the Carino family, mm -hmm. right? With the marriage of Princess Irulan, which was a sham, and a long. 12 year bloody jihad where right. Fremen and just went from planet to planet killing everybody who said no. Right. That's that's it's peace, but peace by what? And everyone knows that Irulan was the key to the throne and nothing more. She's not the real wife. She's not even a concubine because he's not sleeping with her. He's right. she's just a trophy. A spoil of war that sits up on a shelf and does right. nothing. She's like a like a access card. <laughs> yes. A formality, you know? Like I just have to yeah. It's the only way this would have worked. He's um, definitely not wrong about that. No. He's <laughs> no. So the priest is outraged and his hate of this Bronzo only confirms what Bronzo is saying. It's easy to see why those who conspire against Muad'Dib use your analysis of history as their rallying argument. And the prologue ends here with Bronzo's last words. I'll not persuade you. I know that. But that argument of conspiracy came before my analysis. 12 years of Muhadib's jihad created that argument. That's what united the ancient power groups and ignited conspiracies against Muhadib. And those are Bronzo's last recorded words. Dang. Odds are he was probably killed right then and there. And he never got to leave the death cell. Jeez. It was, well, so, it was so little, but it's like so much in there you know welcome to reading dune messiah everybody we're Ooh. so glad you're here <laughs> oh, so yes we know where this book is going the next chapter um is going to lead us further into that of bronze is going to set us up um what where this is going we're gonna like, everything's gonna be spelled out right from the beginning just like it was in dune and i uh, i'm so excited some weird stuff's gonna happen in this book we are gonna get new characters we are gonna get new conspiracies we're gonna see Ooh. things we've never seen before and we're gonna watch 
we're going to get our hearts broken over and over again. And I hope you're excited as I am to read Dune Messiah. That's that's how you're selling it. We're going to get our hearts broken over and over again. That's what I need in my life. You know, I don't have enough sadness and disappointment. I just need more. I mean, if it helps, it's not your disappointment. It's somebody <laughs> else's bad stuff happening to him. Your life is relatively great compared to what's happening to Paul. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I'm just... All right. Thank you again to everybody who yeah. has joined us live for this. I've seen 35 people right now here watching. Thank, thank you so much for listening on Spotify. Um. We're going to do the plugs now. Find us on Twitter at Reading Dune, right? You can e email us all your, the spiciest takes you have on Dune. Send it to readingdune at gmail.com. And Evan, we have a Patreon now, right? We do. Yeah. So, Patreon.com slash Reading Dune. It's right there. On the screen. And it probably in the description if you're listening. Um, on the video, we have a special thanks um, that will happen at the beginning of each chapter. So make sure you check that out. Thank you for everybody who has donated so far. We are excited to do this book. We have a lot more coming. Um, and uh, yeah, that's so good. Evan, how, how do you feel? I feel great. Here we are. We're back. We're back, baby. Doing a oh. thing. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh all right so yep every week reading a new chapter if you want to join our discord i know lots of people have been asking for the evan diaz reading plan if you want to read with him <laughs> so you want to be just as confused or as furious <laughs> as he is which a lot of people are just excited about your takes evan on what you think's gonna happen like they know what weird scene is and you're just going to freak out over it. And so we're, I don't, I'm excited for it too, but wow. All right, yeah. dude. And I mean, in the discord, I like announce every time I start reading, like right before we do the episode. So if you keep your eye on that, you can actually read at the exact same time as me. And if, and our discord is full of Dune experts. Well, not experts. We're not, none of us are experts. We're all just people who like books and that's awesome. But if you have questions about later books in the Dune series, like Heretics or Chapter House or God Emperor, we have people in there that will answer questions for you. They are probably more knowledgeable than me. <laughs> and that's okay, because yeah. I definitely don't know everything. So we're excited to have you, and thank you for listening with us. Stay, Stay spicy. spicy. Hey, we, we did it! <laughs>